Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca Roberson. I'm a senior elections communication specialist with the elections group. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining our communications resource desk workshop, um, telling our story. Before we get started, I'm going to go over some housekeeping things. So I just want to mention that the Q&A feature is turned on for all attendees. Um, you can ask questions throughout the presentation, and we will have a dedicated section at the end to get all of those answered, hopefully. Um, I would also like to do a quick background on the elections group for folks who are not as familiar. Um, so the elections group is an elections consulting partnership or firm founded by former election officials, Jennifer Morell and Noah Prates. We work with state and local election officials to implement new programs and improve processes for voters, excuse me, and stakeholders. We provide guidance, resources, direct management, um, and support for jurisdictions. And our team were all made up of former election officials with experience at the state, local, and federal levels of government. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for listening to my elevator pitch. And I'm excited to turn this workshop over to former NPR correspondent and current communications advisor for the elections group, Pam Fessler. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I'm so glad that you are taking your time out of the summer to uh, join us for this communication workshop, because as you all know, besides actually running elections, communications is probably one of the most important things that you do, and, and often some of the most challenging things. And I'm very happy to be joined by two experts in the field. Uh, who are going to help guide this conversation and talk about some of the things that they have learned um, trying to communicate with the public. Um, first, we have uh, Peter Bartz Gallagher, who is the Director of Communications for the Office of the Minnesota Secretary of State. Welcome, Peter. And then we have um, Gabriela Caceres Kelly, who's the Recorder in Pima County, Arizona. Welcome. Um, before we start, maybe each of you could talk a little bit about your jurisdictions and and what your main job is, especially when it comes to communications. Peter, you want to start? Sure, yes. Thanks, Pam. Thanks uh, to the Elections Group and um, Rebecca and her whole team, and for everyone joining us this afternoon. Um, yeah, I'm Peter Bartz Gallagher. I'm comms director at the Minnesota Secretary of State's office. And my job there is to make sure that everyone in the whole world knows uh, the great things that we're doing in elections and voting and for voters in the state of Minnesota and um, from the Secretary of State, Steve Simon. Um, we have a really excellent culture of voting there, but um, like everywhere else, we're not immune to um, uh, the corrosive dis disinformation that um, has spread throughout our system. And so um, what I try to do is um, push back on that. And in a lot of ways we'll talk about today, um, make sure our voters and um, the people who are looking at Minnesota from uh, other states or even around the world um, understand that uh, we're hopefully doing things the very best we can there and um, hopefully setting some examples that other people can learn from. Thanks. Thank you. Gabriella? Spiktash, everybody. Anya Nyaptogi Gabriella Castres Kelly, Bismo Ochkuk Anjun, Anya Wikapima Chukshan Ohahandam. Hi, everybody. My name is Gabriela Casares Kelly. I'm from the communities of Bismo'o and Kuk, which are located in beautiful Pima County, southern Arizona, um, where I now serve as the elected county recorder. I've been in office since 2021. Um, we are an office that oversees voter registration, early voting, and document recording for the county. Um, and we have around 630,000 registered voters in our jurisdiction, um, the main portion of that being in the metropolitan uh, city of Tucson. Um, and we are actually in the middle of a city of Tucson election today, <laughs> um, as well as uh, rural and tribal areas. Um, it, so our, it's a very, it's a very diverse um, area. And we're, it's, I just learned recently we're the 15th largest county um, in the country. So um, geographically, we're we're very huge. Um, we it is it's been amazing uh, to be in this position and to um, try to figure out the communication strategy. Um, and it's been really wonderful uh, for me um, as as I shared. Um, 
in all in my traditional language, I'm Native American. I'm the first Native American to be elected um, to a countywide seat in here in Pima County, um, which is a state. We're in a state that has 22 distinct tribal nations, 21 federally recognized tribes. Um, and so that, that's kind of significant. I'm only um, the fourth or fifth Native American to hold a countywide seat um, at, you know, at this level. And there's only 15 counties here in Arizona. Uh, so uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate um, being able to share my perspective today. Great. Thank you both again for being here. And let's get started. Um, so uh, the reason I'm here is because when I retired in 2021, I think it was, um, I was trying to figure out what I could do to help um, election officials who I had covered for 20 years um, and knew that they had such a huge job um, ahead of them, especially after the 2020 election, what I could do to help. And um, I went going around talking to many, many people, many groups, election officials, people I had worked with. One of the things they said was we really need help with communications. And um, so I worked with the, I, I, I joined with the elections group to come up with a guide. Um, and we call this guide, Telling Our Story. And one of the reasons we call it Telling Our Story is because that is what most communication is about. You as an individual, you as an election official are, are, are communicating with your voters, you're communicating with the public, you are talking to them, you are telling the story of the elections, the story of how they work, um, why you are doing what you are doing, what the role of the public is in these elections. Um, so what I did to, to put this um, guide together was to um, go around and just talk to lots and lots of people who are in the field. What were some of the things, what were some of the techniques that you used to communicate with the public that you found were most effective? Um, keeping in mind the fact that you have, we have big jurisdictions, small jurisdictions, we have ones that have lots of resources, ones that don't. And we pull together this guy. And um, in the, oh, I, actually one thing I do, do want to just mention, when we called it telling our story, initially we were going to say, we were going to call it telling your story, an elections communications guide, but we decided to call it telling our story, because this is everybody's story, not only election officials, but the public's story, how our elections work, why they're important, and why you can trust them or should you trust them, why you should, and, and, and how they work and how we can all be involved. So, um, and, and then when it comes to elections, obviously you guys are the best ones to tell this story. Um, so we pulled together all of these different, um, um, different um, guidelines. And um, if you can, I could get the next slide, please. Yeah, okay. So it's kind of the main, practices, we put it into all uh, four different areas. And you can, you will be able to see this guide. Um, Rebecca's going to put a link to it in the, um, in, in the chat at some point. And I'm going to actually start from the bottom. Obviously, part of it was how, what are some of the best techniques you can use for educating your voters about the process? And how it works, because obviously it's confusion and misunderstanding our lack of understanding about how it works that sometimes leads to misinformation or just chaos at the polling place. So it's very important, obviously, to educate voters and to get them to come out um, to, to vote. Um, another section is on working with the media, which is increasingly important um, that you need to use and, and work with the media to help communicate with the public. Another uh, um, section is talking about countering misinformation, different techniques that people have found to be very effective ways of countering misinformation. And then the last part, which I personally kind of think is the most important is just overall, how can you use communications from your office to promote trust, respect, and enthusiasm for our election system, and also the people who, who, who run it, who run it. How can we make people excited and confident in their elections? Because it's such a crucial thing. And, you know, so why, 
we talk about in the context of storytelling is that you are trying to present people with accurate information, factual information with whatever you do, you know, whether it's a press release, anything, but you're also trying to do it in an interesting and engaging way. Every communication that you have is competing with tons and tons of other communication that all of your constituents are receiving simultaneously, as you as we all know. Um, again, it's also helping you um, work with the media to help tell your story because the media is telling stories, right? Newspaper reporters, radio reporters, they are trying to tell stories. You, these, this offers ways to work with them. Um, and then also just kind of a step further establishes you as a trusted source of information and to help build trust in elections. So, um, and, and what I do, I, we, the guide came out in the beginning of 2022. Honestly, so many election offices I saw during the course of 22 really adopted a lot of these techniques. Many were already doing it. Many have adopted, there was such an improvement, I think, in 2022 in adopting some of these techniques and working and communicating with the public. Um, but there's still, obviously, there's been a lot of turnover in the field. Um, and there's still some people who are pretty reluctant or, or just not sure exactly how to approach um, their communication with the public. So that's what we hope this workshop and this guide will um, help you do. So I wanted to start first with um, Peter. Um, <laughs> so one of the things, Peter, that um, one of my favorite quotes when I started to work on this guide was from Peter, who was one of the people who I interviewed, one of the many people I interviewed uh, to try and get some tips on what were some good communications uh, techniques. And I'm sure, Peter, this is not the quote that you thought I was going to use. <laughs> um, we were talking about, you know, just fighting misinformation and, and, and just confusion. And you just said offhandedly, she, you know, I quote, I sometimes think if I could just spend 10 minutes with each voter in Minnesota, we'd have this cleared up. And the quote was so wonderful because that captured what you are trying to do, right? You are trying to talk to each of your voters, but we all know you can't do that. Um, it's just impossible, but it is this one-to-one -one communication on a personal level where we can clear up uh, misunderstandings, we can, we can answer questions. So my question to you is then how, since you couldn't talk to everybody in person, what were some of the things that you have done to um, kind of replicate that experience and communicate with the voters of Minnesota? Thank you uh, for highlighting that and particularly the, the aspect of it, which was sort of an unguarded comment and frankly came from a sort of a place of frustration at the time. Um, uh, we were seeing so many things pop up that were just, absurd on their face and like, can we just explain to you how this really works? And um, of course, uh, we don't live in a world where I have those uh, those 10 minutes with every voter, but you're exactly right. The the intent of that um, of that desire is to create personal connections. So we know people are going to encounter info that corrodes faith in the election. Um, that's just part of the the landscape right now. Um, and, in, and in the world where we could individually connect with them, that would be really wonderful. Um, since a lot of this information is portrayed in sort of pseudo-scientific or, or from a place of authority, I wanted to be that um, personal antidote to that and and uh, become have our office or have election officials in general be um, uh, the the channel for um, that to be pushed back against. The sort of shift that's happened um, since the time I said that and now is that early on, I mean, after the 2020 election and um, and uh, proceeding from that, um, it it became sort of easy to see this problem in a really daunting fashion. So um, it was me and my office, my team, 
or a team in another state or in another county against a nation state who is committed to ruining our elections or a billion dollar media empire or all of social media and Silicon Valley and their algorithms or, or something like that. And, and um, the idea of having personal conversations to fight against things of that scale is, is uh, as I say, totally daunting or, or impenetrable uh, as a problem. The way I have sort of um, changed the thinking around that is to go local with it. And so um, it turns out that the sort of substance, the, the on the ground components of misinformation and disinformation are occurring at county board meetings and township meetings and city elections committees and so on. Um, these, uh, you know, you'll be familiar with the groups that travel the country and do these presentations, but many of them are, are just local to our, our state and I'm sure others as well. And so there is the location where those 10 minute conversations can happen. And so uh, since then and, and through 2022, and I hope beyond, we've been focused on being the resource provider. And I'll talk about this in, in all of the um, all of the uh, topic areas, but changing the information landscape, changing the culture of information, so that um, it's our office defining the terms in a pro-voter and pro-democracy way, and talking about what we share, and that um, of course the people administering these things are our friends and our neighbors, and when um, when a constituent calls into a county election office or a city election office a lot of times those constituents are more well known. It's not a state level office like mine, it's not faceless. Um, and uh, a lot of times that sort of friend and neighbor component is more accessible. And so giving those, uh, let's say county election officials, a consistent and productive and um, uh, positive set of resources to respond to disinformation Sometimes it is a little more than a 10 minute conversation, uh, but maybe it's 15 minutes or, or beyond, but that that's the space where those can happen. And we're hoping to continue to develop those relationships. They'll develop the resources to make them even more responsive um, to those constituencies that need them. Yeah, and, and we can talk about this a little bit more later, but, but, you, but what you're doing is providing, helping them with the messaging, quite frankly, right? You know, because obviously you, like, you know, most states, you know, local election officials ne don't necessarily have the resources to exactly that message. So it's really important to work with your state or, or other uh, larger entities sometimes that do have more resources. Um, exactly. One of the things that we have um, emphasized in the guide is that with these communications, that um, you know that that it. Um, I guess that was the wrong one. I think it's back one. Okay, no, no. I guess this is the right one. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm. See, I'm not so good at communications. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, is, is that, you know, and this goes to what Peter was talking about, about um, that the local officials sometimes are better at communicating with, with their constituents and addressing these issues, that it's very important to personalize the messages that they send out and to, and to be themselves. Um, we, we also talk a lot about in your communications with, um, with, with voters that you try and avoid any kind of technical jargon as much as possible. You really want to talk to them in plain language. Um, we, we also emphasize that um, it's good in these communications not to always be kind of doom and gloom saying, oh, this didn't happen, this didn't happen, you know, this is false, whatever, but that that this is a, a this should be a fun process, an exciting, uplifting process, and to try and imbue your communications with, um, with some of that sentiment. And I think, Gabriela, your office has um, done a lot, I think, to embrace 
some of these principles. Um, so can you talk a little bit about it? You, you had a, um, a campaign or have a campaign with your new I Voted sticker, uh, which lots of people have I Voted stickers, but this one I think is, is, is quite interesting and you have done a lot in your effort to try and communicate with your voters, not only about this campaign, but what it kind of represents. What, what's the larger message that you're trying to send here? Right. Do we do we want to see the video first? Oh, or? Yeah, let's, let's, yeah. let's just put, yeah, this is so uh, before you start, just real quickly, I'll just explain that. This, so this is a, a TikTok video uh, that Gabriella's uh, office created about the I voted sticker. Which we can't hear. We can't hear it. Uh oh. Oh no! <laughs> and of course, oh, well, you know what? You're just gonna have to recreate it. <laughs> I know, and I'm, and I'm, I, I really wish that I had rewatched it this morning. Um, so this is our I voted sticker. Um, it's it reads I voted, Ani Ant Wodar, Yo Vote, and it says Pima County votes. Hashtag Pima County votes. Um, the reason for that, we used to have three separate I voted stickers here in Pima County, but um, the majority of, I mean, every single person um, who received a ballot by mail, around 400,000 people, would receive one in English, and we had Spanish and the Thon Autumn versions here in the office, and so only really the people who showed up at our office would get those and they were highly coveted they were you know people were really excited every single time we had those um they were they thought it was a, a great reflection of our of our county um we are about an hour away from the u.s mexico border and um pima county is home to the thon autumn nation um the the tribe where i'm from and the language is still spoken um it's an oral language and um it's reflective of our community when we started designing this, we had tried to, um, we also were really interested in trying to get Braille. Um, and that wasn't something um, that we were able to do within the time frame. Um, and we had also thought about like, well, we could also just do that in the future. This isn't the one and only time we're ever going to have this. And that could kind of create a collector's item type of situation um, because people were really motivated by the I Voted stickers. Um, they love to hear it. Um, there was a, a little bit of hesitancy um, because people were worried about um, white supremacists um, being uh, angry that there was multiple languages um, listed on, on this I Voted sticker. But it ultimately, there is no official language uh, for our area, and but these are languages that are spoken, and it, it's very much reflective of the count of the county. Pima County, Pima is an awesome word. Uh, Tucson, Chukran, that's an awesome word. Um, Arizona, Arshon, that is an awesome word. Um, and so, even though people are not really familiar and don't recognize that they're speaking my traditional language it's embedded in almost everything around us, um, place names and street names and um, even, even some of the um, cult cultural things and customs and the same thing with Spanish. Um, and so we see that it's intertwined and uh, we had an amazing response to this. Um, this uh, TikTok I made, um, I, I specifically wanted people to hear um, the language because it, people looked at the Anyant Wadort, they saw that it wasn't a language that they were familiar with. It gave them pause. I knew people were going to be looking it up. So we put an I voted, we put the same sticker up on our website and we made it clickable so that it um, went to an article about it so people could read and then also a little hyperlink uh, to the TikTok so that they could hear it. Um, and I And I just explained all of that. All of those, um, I don't quite know what the reach was for that. Um, you know, I think on TikTok, we, we probably saw something like 2000 impressions or something like that. But we also put it on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and then it got picked up by news sources. Um, and so, you know, it was included in little local news spots and things like that and um you know with the correct pronunciation and so people were just really excited about it um they think that it's reflective of their community and they're all like they're all 
where can I get one? How do I get one? Oh, yeah. I have, oh, this is how I vote. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's great. And I think it really um, drives home the point about the need for whatever communications you're doing, that you try to reach people where they are, mm -hmm. that you know, not everybody is going to, well, very few people, quite frankly, are going to go to your website. Um, you know, that's not where people are going to get your information so that you have to focus on, and I assume TikTok, you were trying to get it a somewhat younger uh, constituents, right? Um, actually, I I kind of fell into TikTok. Um, I it, it is it is actually as a as a candidate, not outside of the office. It is my highest um, uh, outreach, I guess, that I have. Like I have like something like twenty four thousand followers or something like that, which wow. is more than my Twitter, uh, which is which is crazy, which is also high. Um, but I actually just found that it's a really easy um, platform to create content on. It's super easy to use. It's very user friendly. Um, and you're able to edit something and kick it out within maybe 10 minutes. Um, you know, I'm, I insist on uh, captions and, and different things like that. Um, so I have a higher expectation for what I want to see in, in all of these. Um, but really, this just takes a few minutes of uh, me in my office uh, filming different things. And it's easy to manipulate the, the editing. And so because of that, it's it's just the easiest platform. Um, right. I don't I'm not having to download any specific fancy software. I'm not having to do, you know, learn a whole new program or download it to another program so that I can provide captions or nothing. It's all included in there. And so it's just an easy um, way for me to create content that didn't, it wasn't really a heavy lift and, and it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, and again, right, and, and and it's personal, you know, it's again that you are clearly in this talking to your voters. Um, I mean, I know, Peter, that you've also um, done a lot with social media. What are your experiences? What have they been? Are you like, what, what, what are you thinking now? I mean, do you have any sort of tips for people as, as we approach 2023 and 2024 elections? Yes, yeah, sure. I can see from the screenshot there, 4,400 followers. It's important to remember for me always that an office like mine is never going to have mass appeal. It's the Secretary of State. That's it's understood. You know, um, we have our reporters and our political junkies and our democracy heads, and and um, that's um, that's totally fine because um, the purpose it serves. And uh, going back to the first question I was talking about, I'm I'm planting the seeds of. Uh, uh, voting culture of the terminology that we want to use when we talk about elections and voting, the idea that this is something we do together in our state and in all the communities of that state. Um, and uh, if I can use the I word, um, you know, we we consider the people who are um, followers on our social media to be influencers in their own communities. And so when they repost our stuff or they internalize the messages that um, we're putting out on social media about um, how our elections are, uh, how are, how they're run and how they're safe and how they're secure and um, and how they're, it's important to participate, then they can have those conversations with people that they encounter at the gym and at the dinner table and at work and uh, at, in their daily lives. And, and they get to act as exponents of our message of that of those key um, uh, key terms or, or key aspects uh, that we want to promote, and so um, it is a sort of grassrootsy thing, and um, we we spend time and we want to um, uh, make sure that we have a um, consistent stream of stuff and that it's fun and that we're looking at new um, channels all the time. We don't have a um, TikTok account, and the internal debate is raging about Threads right now, and um, uh, we could talk more about <laughs> the social media landscape going forward, but um, uh, we we I like to think of it in, in that way as a, um, a really valuable tool for, um, again, sort of providing those resources out to the community, not necessarily like a one to one um, connection from our office. And do you actually um, help any of the local um, um, election offices? come up with social media posts or is it, you know, that help them with their social media? 
Um, um, I, I guess I'd be glad to consult on that. I don't think we've ever been asked specifically, but we provide sort of um, template content. Um, you know, uh, here's how we're talking about this. Feel free to adapt this. Um, you know, not all, I, I guess m most of those local governments do have um, uh, social media accounts. I think uh, more, um, more commonly they would use it in um, email uh, newsletter type or in graphics right. on their, um, uh, if they have uh, local government television or stuff like that. Right, because in, in some, some states have provided a little bit of, uh, you know, as you say, templates that um, kind of, you know, obviously elections are different in every single place, but that, you know, some of the common messages that can be used um, throughout the state. They, they, some of them have developed campaigns, advertising campaigns or communication campaigns that are more statewide or regional wide. Um, there's a big one in the Bay Area um, in California where a number of the election offices have banded together to share resources in communications because obviously everybody is you know, short on resources. So wherever possible, that helps. Um, one of the things, um, Gabriella, that I, I just love um, is you, your, your team, when you got into office, you put together uh, this voice guide or you started working on this voice guide, you know, just sort of to set the tone. What would is, what's the tone you wanted for your communications? And you, you do emphasize a lot of the same things we were talking about, you know, just use plain language, active voice, should be fun, should be personal. And one of the favorite things I thought I saw where, where you wrote that um, the tone should be like your favorite teacher, or your spunky auntie, auntie, your playful, celebratory of people, inclusive of all, that this was the tone that you want to get into your communication. So can you talk a little bit about how you've been able to do that? <laughs> yes, so I'm I'm obsessed with social media. I I I love social media so much. It's been so interesting um to watch it and observe it. Um and you know, I got in early in Facebook a million years ago and um it was kind of accidental and I um have continued to use social media just talking to my friends and family. And that's literally what I'm doing when I'm thinking about who I'm posting to. I literally think about certain people within my own community that I know are going to watch my videos. So I always talk about like my sister. My sister, Elisa, is a completely apolitical person. She hates talking about politics, but she loves watching my videos. Um, and so she'll kind of learn a little thing because she watched, you know, whatever video. And she's like, oh, that's easy. Um, I'm always thinking about my cousin, Naomi, who lives in a very rural part of um, the, the county and wondering how if I say a general informational thing, does that apply to Naomi? Um, and which is my other cousins and my nieces and nephews and, and, and all of that. And then I think about my father-in-law, his birthday is today, um, who my father-in-law is a little bit on the conspiracy theorist uh, side. And so when I'm talking about all of these things, you know, how am I delivering that information to those specific people and where are they going to get tripped up or confused by that? Um, one of the things that I talk about all of the time is that we are voting nerds. Every single one of you took time out of your day, put it on your calendar to come and talk about elections communication. That's pretty nerdy. Um, we are really, we live and breathe and think about um, elections and the elections realm nonstop. Me and my husband, we look up campaign finance for fun. We're like, oh my gosh, did you see this? Um, yeah, I bet a, a ton of you all do that. But we cannot, um, you know, we're in, a, we're in a bubble and we have to be thinking about who is outside of that election state bubble um, or that um, 
thinking about my sister Lisa, who would much rather go watch Indiana Jones than learn, than come to this um, and 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 learn about elections communications or or anything like that. Like this is our bread and butter. This is what we we like to do. Um, and so I think about that a lot of times. And then I am um, a former educator. I have a ton of students who follow me. Um, over the years, I was an educator for 14 years. Uh, and I'm also thinking about that group of, of students, um, actually the, the students that pulled me into the elections realm because I was trying to register them and we were experiencing difficulties. And so um, I think about that voice um, a lot. And then when I got into office, of course, when you're the elected official, you're not able to create your own content half the time. You have to hand that off to somebody else. Um, somebody else is going to work on that. And so the guide that we created for the office was specifically to list my intention of what I wanted to see because I have a high level of expectation for um, for this office and the way that we communicate. I think I've seen um, other jurisdictions and, you know, it kind of comes out, like, especially when people are really jaded. And I, I know that I'm, I have the privilege of being a fresh new face in, you know, only being in office since 2021. Um, but sometimes I'd hear some finger pointing and like these voters are stupid. The voters, why can't they just listen to what we've told them? Why do we have to keep telling them again? I didn't like that. It it hurt my heart to hear that because I knew when I was first registering students how difficult it was to actually get registered or where the forms actually were. People didn't know that off the top of their heads. Um, and so I really wanted to make sure that we weren't talking to people in that way. I, I don't like to be talked to in that way. Um, and I think that we need to work harder to demystify the process um, of voter registration and voting. Like we need to, you know, we have to remember that we are not all starting from the same starting lines. Um, Native Americans, we didn't have the right to vote until 1948 um, here in, in Arizona. Like that's not a long time. Uh, you know, we didn't have protections until 1965. My grandma didn't speak English. She didn't have language rights um, or language translation rights until mid 1970s. That's not that long ago. And right. so we have to make it friendly. We have to make it inclusive. We have to um, think about our, our real community and what our real community looks like and what they're interested in and what they want to read. And then also recognize like for me, Anytime, if I put up one post, I'm not reaching 630,000 registered voters. And if there's one KOLD or KGA9 or you know, Arizona Daily Star piece, that's not going to reach every single one of my constituents. So we have to keep doing it. Yeah, and I think an important thing, I mean, you, you clearly... Um, are, are exhibiting, you know, your joy and your enthusiasm really comes through, which is wonderful. And I'm sure it comes through all your communications. Um, I did in the course of uh, putting together this guide, you know, talk to a lot of election officials. Some really aren't very outgoing. You know, they they are, they're, they, they're reticent. They don't really want to um, be that person who is out front and, 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 uh, and the, the voice or the face of, of a elections in their office. So maybe we can talk a little bit about, Peter, about that. Um, you know, what are some of, I guess, some of the techniques that people have raised is trying to find somebody else within your community who is, it can be a spokesperson for you with, you know, another, maybe an influencer or, you um, somebody else within the in, within your office maybe poll workers that you should employ p other people within the community to to help sell this message um and and i think so so have you found that at all peter like what are, what are some of the things that you've been doing um i would say that you're very right that it's uh challenging we've had a sort of long simmering idea of, and it's taken sort of different forms through social media or a video we would do or ads or whatever else um, about let's get the voices of election officials out there. Um, and this even extends into our work at the state legislature or, or the way we kind of organize information in a lot of ways. People are reluctant to, in this political environment, um, 
be a public face and and I can totally understand why they would want to keep their head down and administer their elections and um uh not necessarily be on camera or talk about their experiences being harassed or um abused much less the uh, successful parts of election administration um we i'm going to continue to <laughs> to think that that would be a really valuable um effort and um you know part of that happens in the news media not just like our own produced stuff so um if i'm trying to connect a reporter with someone um, who has some experience in election administration in whatever region of the state or whatever county um uh that that's more um achievable usually um we can get uh, uh, a news story working especially if it's media that are local to that election official um that has a more um i don't know it's it's more acceptable for whatever reason but um getting those stories fully told and out there um uh remains a goal um i don't know people may have seen this faces of democracy campaign right. um and that has been a really I think really excellently done version of a similar thing kind of on a national okay. level issue one or something issue one yes issue one is the name of the org right yeah um and so they have these profiles of sometimes federal officials or state officials or county or city all all sorts of levels all kinds of people involved in the election administration world telling their personal stories personalizing um this world uh where it's true we we are um some nerds but um we've got some good things to say i hope too but uh, i i don't have a um a good answer for how how we solve that at our own level except to say we're going to keep trying and and i do think it would um a, a local version of that would be great right right and 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 a number of communities are doing that um i think i think maricopa county has been doing a lot um as far as you know sort of highlighting different um election workers and 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 I also have noticed recently a bunch of um awards that uh, individual poll workers have been receiving in different states just to kind of elevate uh the profession and say again this is a committed person who you can trust who is working very hard to make your elections safe and secure um I, I think another thing when we, we might go back one slide here um we talk a lot in the guide and obviously this is an issue that you both confront all the time just you know how do you deal with kind of the flood of misinformation and even uh, disinformation about elections you know what is what have you found is the most effective way to communicate with your voters about these um, about this disinformation. Um, we we talk in the in the guide about a number of things. You know, obviously bringing people in, showing them how the process works, so they can see it firsthand. Answering questions, being as open as transparent as possible. There's also been a lot about just having like MythBuster sites. Um, which I know, which which you talk about, you know, some of the myths that are out there and what the reality is. And I know, Peter, that you adopted that, I guess, since we spoke um, in Minnesota. Can you talk about that a little bit? Do you think it's an effective thing to do? Do you have any tips for people if they do do something like this? Yes, of course. Um, and you see the URL right there. Everyone can um, go steal from our uh, version as we did from uh, our predecessors. Um, it, it there was sort of uh, this was a big project of ours um, throughout last summer, and it um, involved not just the communications team, but voter outreach and our elections administrators in the office too. All um, trying to um, humanize and plain languageize and um, uh, make accessible all of these things that election administrators take for granted they know how risk limiting audits work or they know how um post election reviews and um uh public accuracy testing and and all the rest the sort of guts of why elections are safe and secure um but turning those into public facing um bite sized snippets that that both make sense to people and do a good job of refuting specific types of disinformation was a really big project. 
Um, and it's very much always in flux as new things pop up. We have assemble our crew and say, do we need a new entry for this, you know, uh, tidbit of disinformation that seems to be flowing around? Yes, let's do it. Okay, how how should it read? How do we, as you have right there on the slide, lead with the truth? Not you may have heard this totally false thing, but actually, no, no it it starts from the truth. Fact: the election results are. Uh, checked over and over again to maintain accuracy. And here's how that works. And here's how, why that is. Um, and, and the page acts as a really strong reference guide for the news media. So when they have a question, go to this link, let me know if you have any other questions, like here's how that it gets explained. For our county election officials, oh, I got a um, call from 100 constituents this week asking for hand counts. What do you have on that? Here, here's the vetted bite-size uh, snippet of why that doesn't make sense and why um, uh, why we do things the way we do. And so it it kind of, um, you know, again, I'm not under an illusion that people are rushing to the Secretary of State's website to see what we posted. It, it's a repository and it's a document of our um, our best efforts in refuting these things one by one, and and even adding things, especially where it comes to transparency in the process. Um, and to that end, it's been really valuable, um, just as a consistent go-to guide that everyone in the office can use, and everyone statewide and right. anywhere. And I office. think it, right, it's very important what you said about you know you also pointing the media to it. Like you can probably point your local officials to it. Um, Gabriella, how about you? Or is that a, a, a something that you've had to deal with much at all? Or we we get it a lot with our our phones, and one of the strategies that we have is changing the outgoing message to address whatever concern that there is. So there have been no changes to voter files or there have been, you know, things like that. And sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll point to websites um, and I'll, I'll, I have even taken on the phones myself. And um, by the time I get to somebody, they're like, oh, I, I think my question was just answered in your message. Can I confirm this? Yes. Okay, great. Thank great. you. And that's the end of it. And so um, we have, we've really spent a lot of time up, uh, uh, thinking about that outgoing phone message, uh, because that's, I mean, so much, so much gets uh, directed at our staff, and then kind of <laughs> sometimes it, if it, if it is it's a heavy conspiracy day, we might have to make that message uh, a little longer and make people work to get to us um, a little bit by providing the resources that are available. Um, I am very interested in making a, a just the facts type of website. Um, uh, Maricopa County, they're always talking about research and development, R&D, rob and duplicate. Um, so I, I, I love definitely borrowing um, uh, ideas from them. I've thought of making like an election nerd um, uh, page on our website because at, this, at the very end of the day, people like my sister, and my cousin Naomi and my well, maybe my father-in-law cares a little more, but 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 my sister and my cousin, they they aren't caring about half of this stuff. They're not they're not falling into the realm of the of the conspiracy theories. They just need to know what's important to them. And so we always um when we're responding to things, it's really just to clarify information or point to resources or, you know, we're not really addressing, uh, like refuting. We're just saying, this is what we do. Right. Um, and really kind of putting emphasis on this is how we, we maintain the security of your ballot, or this is, this is the, the wonderful work that we're doing. And we just continue to say that. And I, I'm really, <sighs> You know, when I, when we think about the conspiracy theories and, and we're in a bubble and the conspiracy theories, theorists are in a bu bubble as well with us, um, unfortunately. Um, you know, we also have to think about the hundreds and thousands of other people who not only are not engaged in the conspiracy, but simply just don't know how to participate. Right. And that's who I want to focus on the most. Um, so I want to I want to address this you know, but 
you know, at the same time, my sister has already stopped listening. Like she's, she's not even interested in this conversation. It's like, oh, it's not relevant. This is too much. Right. So- right. Yeah. And it, I mean, that's, that's the challenge, you know, you, 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 as you say, and, and, and which is why it's so important to have, you know, clear, transparent, um, I would also say sort of non-judgmental communications and that, you know, you just kind of repeat it over and over again, because at some point people will become, you know, but it might, they might become interested too. Um, I, we have so much to talk about, but we also have so, a, a bunch of questions, which I'd love to get to. Um, so let me just ask uh, the first question we hear. Um, Gabriella, the first one says, Gabriella, I love your TikTok channel. I guess that person got to see it. Our office is working on a TikTok channel and we have been using your channel as one of our models. TikTok is a good way to reach younger voters and educate them on the work we do. Have you faced any obstacles to using TikTok in Arizona? Lots of state and counties are banning TikTok on government devices. Any advice on getting started? So yeah, (laughs) Um, the state uh, recently banned TikTok and um, I messaged over to the to the governor's office and I said, does the governor hate my TikToks? What's happening? <laughs> uh, <laughs> they thought it was funny. Um, <laughs> but I'm not a state employee that I'm not um, uh, a state government employee that doesn't apply to us here. Um, so it we're just continuing on. It's a great platform for creating content on. And, you know, as I said, yes, um, uh, reaching younger, uh, a younger audience, but also just having that, um, content creation and being able to put that on Instagram, you know, so like the, maybe the teenagers are on TikTok, um, but on Instagram, it's, you know, the, maybe the 20 to 30 years old and then Facebook, we, you know, all of that can, can be translated over to all of those platforms. And it also provides an opportunity for those, those talking uh, points. One thing that I think is really important is if you are on TikTok, if you're trying to um, create content there, you need to use TikTok. You need to um, watch what other people are putting on. That is really important to see what the trends are. You know, the algorithms find you. Uh, mine is full of like book nerds, voting nerds, and pugs. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so I get a lot of those um, type of videos. And so like seeing and hearing what other people are are doing, you'll get a great uh, moment of inspiration. And maybe it's just something silly, you know, like um, the Pima County Public Library here in, in Pima County they have an excellent uh, social media. Uh, one of the, the the funniest ones I saw was it was just a, a a video of the outside of the building and then Shrek in a leather pair of leather pants dancing to you know some song and it went viral. Um, and then at, because it started being a part of people's algorithms and it started being part of their everyday then they were able to share content about their summer reading programs. And so I think sometimes we're overly serious and I do have the luxury as a local, (laughs) as a local recorder and not state, (laughs) statewide, um, being able to be a little silly um, on that platform. And what it does is it creates this relatable content. People are interacting more with it. They're going to write some comments always respond to your comments. Um, Even if it's a complaint, just say, thank you. Um, You you know, can you call our office? We'd love to talk to you more about this. Show that you're being responsive, um, like people's likes or comments or whatever. Um, And I think that's really important to be engaging with people because yeah, you might be able to to get them in on a silly, silly Shrek video, but that the next time when you're actually putting information out into the community, they're going to be like, oh, this came up because I always follow this page. I, you know, I trust this page Um, and, and you're going to be able to get some of that. So I think people overly script sometimes. No, just, just watch a few videos and then see what you can do. And, and do you do it all yourself in the, in your office? I'm yes. And I, I've, um, we're, we're working on this. We, we need to like have an, a social media manager. Right. What I typically do is I will, um, come up with an, with 
a conversation that we need to have like what is the conversation on the the phones oh, okay so um I will maybe come up with like five different talking points and I use the word um a lot I'm just I'm having to get over it uh, <laughs> just, people, people are tolerant <laughs> people are listening to the message right uh, I might bounce that off with my communications uh person and then and then we just we make a video and then I hand it off to them and then they put it everywhere that they need to and so it playing with it I think is is the most effective okay. great thank you um and and another question that we have Peter um is you know obviously there's there's so many now social media platforms you you raise the issue about threads all of a sudden everybody's like okay should we move from twitter to threads you know what's the more most effective so so how how do you either draw the line or make decisions about what's the best way to um where you know where to put you to decide where to put your limited resources yeah as gabriella just said it takes a lot of time to be creative and it takes time to be funny and it takes time to um develop this material in a way that's consistent and and works for any given office and so there there's no rules about what you have to do and um you know part of it is constituencies uh who are you trying to reach where where are they um facebook is still really 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 big and twitter is still really 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 big even though they're both sort of on shakier ground than they maybe felt a couple of years ago. Um, but um, I know that a lot of local officials, even in my state, don't have, not only do they not have social media people, in besides elections, they might have uh, licensing or public housing right, or right. ditch and drainage work or all kinds of other stuff. So elections is a slice of what they do. And so how do you also sort of maintain this um, uh, public profile that's supposed to be really appealing and fun. It, it's hard and it, and it does take a lot of time. I would say do what you can, lean on the state or uh, groups like the election group for templates and resources to make it a little bit more turnkey. Um, learn what you can about, uh, just as Gabriella was saying, the, the formats may be different, but there's a lot of overlap in how the content can be formatted. So um, you can save time by making things that work for both Instagram and Twitter and TikTok all at once or or whatever. Um, but um, it's it I I will admit it's hard and and it takes a lot of time and resources to make it work well. And again, I think that that um, is another example of why it's so important to try and bring in as broad a community as you can to help you communicate and to help sell this message whenever you can and if you are able to of course I know that takes work to develop as well but you've got nothing else to do right <laughs> um, unfortunately we are running out of time and I just wanted to mention um, that if you have any additional questions you can um, email them to support at electionsgroup.com. They've got a wonderful team there that can help you with specific um, communications issues or answer some of your broader questions. Um, you also might you know, want, want to take a look at the guide, which again, Rebecca has put a link to uh, in, in the uh, chat or the, I guess the Q&A. Um, again, I wrote it a year ago, things are changing, um, but I still think a lot of it still holds true. But that also brings me to my, I guess, my last, very last question. We all know no two elections are alike. The, the world is changing. We've got AI coming. We've got all these, these new things. Is there any specific thing that you're especially concerned about going forward in terms of communications and any tips that you might have on how to address them? I I just really shortly, like, like I, in 30 seconds. <laughs> Only kidding. No, yeah. I anyway, just saw, I just saw a question in the chat about like, well, what do you what are you doing to not um, amplify these these conspiracy theories questions? Um, I sometimes will, you know, like because that's the journalist's take, and the journalist is calling to ask, how do you respond to that? And I will sometimes scold the, the reporter and I will say, this is what I need you to actually write the, the paper about. I This is the article that you actually need to write is about the integrity that we have and the process that we have. And here's the documentation. And I will 
I will pressure them <laughs> to, to write the story that they should be writing. And so um, I, I have, a, a I don't know, I, I, I say who I want to talk to, I say when I want to talk to them, and I say what I want to talk about. And I, I'm not interested in, in amplifying the conspiracy. So I push back as much as I can. Um, and sometimes if that means me just being vanilla and giving a really boring um, response and, and pointing to statute or pointing to a resource um, and repeating that, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and Peter, the last word um, on that, and actually that just, um, we haven't really talked about this at all, but it's in the guide about how to develop a good working relationship with the media ahead of time so they don't come to you saying, what, ah, rah, 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 but they say, hey, I want to get your side, people are saying this. Um, any last words, Peter? Um, yes, I, I totally agree with that. And I, I look at our relationship with the media always as cultivation. Um, I'm investing energy and investing time into making sure they understand um, as much ahead of time. And so uh, that means down the line, our coverage um, will be more accurate. If something is wrong, we can get it changed. Um, we can push back when, when the terms of the conversation need changing. And I would encourage um, everyone at a local level to cultivate those uh, relationships in the same way. Um, yeah, uh, we're not sure what's gonna be around the bend for 2024, a new form of um, disinfo, a new form of technology or a new form of connecting with people that uh, is gonna seem like it upends everything. But I hope that um, people like in this group right now are gonna be able to um, continue to share information in this way. And um, uh, I, I'll, I'll, always believe in free speech, but I also believe that um, true information that's about our civil rights and what we share here in our governance um, is is superior. And I want to make sure people understand that and can find it in a um, way that's really accessible to them. So I hope um, we're, we're engaged in that project with all of you. Well, I want to thank both of you for uh, engaging today and sharing your um, experiences and recommendations. And we hope the audience uh, got something out of it and that we can continue to trade these ideas because that is what it's all about, is just figuring out what works the best and, and how we can help each other to improve public confidence in elections and, and make sure that people are excited and interested and, and, and fun, including your sister. Uh, <laughs> um, so I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Um, all of the resources, I, again, as I mentioned, have been placed into the chat and it additional information as well as direct support through the election group's communication resource desk can be found at www.electionsgroup.com and they really do have some some great resources so take and they're free take advantage of them uh, thank you so much and, and we hope to see you all again <laughs>